When I was a kid, I didn't go to school. I told people I was home educated, but in reality, there was no classes, there were no textbooks, and there were no exams. So it was a pretty unusual education, but it was great. I lived in a caravan in a field in England. So we had no electricity, we had no hot water, and if we wanted to wash, my dad would go into the field, start a fire underneath a metal bath, and then the whole family would get into the bath. So we didn't really wash that often. For us, our classroom was the forest. I was anyone I wanted to be. I was Harry Potter or Frodo, depending on the day. But this, this time was one of the most beautiful and formative experience in my life. But all good things have to come to an end, and eventually we had to go back to school. And so to do our college entrance exams, we returned, and we'd never really been in a classroom in our lives. But we quickly fit in, we made friends, and we enjoyed studying. And somehow, don't ask me how, I managed to get into Oxford University to study anthropology. And so during that period, I know I must have learned something. Well, I put it down to inspiration. When I lived in the field, I didn't have many friends my age, but there was a constant stream of crazy, wonderful, hippie adults coming in and out of our lives. There was people living in gypsy caravans, that's a guy called Fish. There was a guy called Mick who lived in the field across, who lived in a bus, and his entourage of traveler friends. There was a guy called Dave who lived in a ship and looked like a pirate. And even a guy called Boy, and his name is actually Boy, who lived in a teepee. And so these people are system dropouts, and they loved it. They were great communicators, they had big ideas, and it rubbed off on me and my brother. So by the time I returned to the formal education system, I was pretty open-minded, and I had a real passion to study. So for me, inspiration is the most important thing about education. But what actually is inspiration? Well, to inspire means to breathe in. And it's similar to inhaling. We're filling ourselves with a substance that gives us energy and motivates us to, do, to go beyond our potential. And that's not all, actually. Harvard Business Review reports on some pretty crazy things that inspiration can give people. For one, it can boost people's self-esteem. It can make people more creative. It can make them more optimistic. It can even make them progress faster in work and absorb information quicker. I mean, that's a pretty serious list. If that was a superfood, everyone would be buying it. But the best thing about inspiration is it's free. Anyone can be inspired and anyone can inspire. And in fact, it's people who have nothing and overcome those challenges, or normal people who do great things that are the most inspiring people we can meet. So today, I want to talk about a few people who have made a huge impact on the lives of others. I'm going to start with someone who thinks big. And when I say big, I mean ridiculously big. And I'm also kind of surprised, because he surprised me by coming today. He's in the audience. Um, but I'll leave it up to you to work out who that might be. And so this man, he's my mentor. He's also my boss. Um, and he's called Yoshiomi Tamai, but everyone calls him Tamachan. And 50 years ago, he lost his mother in a car accident in Osaka. And at that time, he was an economic journalist with a regular slot on TV. But after, after suffering that loss, he took it upon himself to fight for the rights and opportunities of other children who suffered in the same way he, de he did. So he decided he wouldn't stop fighting until every child who had been orphaned from a traffic accident had received financial and emotional support. And this is a pretty big goal. But it was so big, people followed it. And quickly, they came close to actually offering that support. And he realized he was going to have to make the goal bigger, or he wasn't going to be able to motivate people. So he expanded it, not just from traffic accidents, but also to include people whose parents had died from disease. But that wasn't enough. Then it was natural disasters. And finally, he expanded it to, to include every single orphan child in Japan.
And now the organization Ashinaga, it supported over 100,000 students receive, the, receive financial and emotional care in Japan. And so fast forward 45 years, and then I met him. I was in Oxford University and he was giving a lecture. And at that time he had some pretty big ideas too. He had decided that Ashinaga was gonna go outside of Japan and go international. His vision was to go to Africa and find the most needy kids with the highest potential and send them to the world's leading universities with the understanding that they'd then return to Africa and be at the forefront of development in the future. And it was going to go on for 100 years. I said ridiculously big. Um, but people, this vision, it was so beautiful and so revolutionary. People, people spoke about it. People talked about it. And it hit national media. It hit international media. And it even he started winning awards as well. But one of the most important things about it is that the people working for him, or the supporters of the movement, they were fighting to reach that goal. So we worked our fingers to the bone to actually make it happen. And now, to date, we've sent students from 35 African countries to leading universities around the world, and that was in four years. <laughs> so what Tamachan did was he set huge goals, big goals, and that set everyone up for a big future. So if you want to inspire, just like Tamatan did, then set big goals. Don't hold back. Tamatan then sent us to Africa. I actually got this in Africa, this memento. So, but he sent us there to various countries to go and find these students who could go to leading universities around the world. And one of these students who had faced incredible difficulties in his life have managed to overcome those, stay positive, and constantly challenge the status quo. William Mantata was born in Limpopo in South Africa. And in primary school age, he had to sell biscuits to support his family. With the money he earned, all he could buy was maize and salt. And that's all that his family could eat. And his mother grew terribly sick and was hospitalized. At that point, he decided to drop all of his work. I he decided to drop all of his studies and start looking for a full-time job. And he searched everywhere for work, and he was rejected one time after another. But finally, the owner of a scrapyard took pity on him and decided to offer him work. And it was dangerous, but it paid. And bit by bit, he earned money. His mother came out of ho hospital, and he was able to return to school. But in spite of all his, his efforts, she still eventually passed away and his siblings were taken away from him. And so he had to live alone in his family home. But in spite of all those difficulties, he continued to fight for the people around him. When his aunt's house burnt down, he, made, he designed and built a generator so that she could power an electric light because it had burnt down from a candle. He also searched through scrap and waste materials to build a computer. And he built the computer with perspex, ed perspex edges, see-through plastic edges, so that he could teach other students exactly how it was built. And when he came to meet Ashinaga for his interview, he arrived at the Japanese embassy with wires on his body. And anyone who's ever been anywhere near an embassy, especially the Japanese embassy, should know that you do not turn up at the embassy with wires on your body. But on closer inspection, he was wearing a trilby, an Italian trilby hat. He'd strapped a lithium, lithium ion battery to the top of it and solar panels on either side so that he could charge his and other people's phones as he walked around. <laughs> and so long story short, William, is coming out to Japan as part of the Ashinaga Africa Initiative this year to study at Keio, to study at Keio Daigaku doing information and environmental sciences. And on top of that, if any of you would like to inspire just like William did, then constantly try to stay positive and challenge the status quo. So the last person I want to speak about 
is also in the crowd today, but I'm again not going to mention who it is. But he's a close friend of mine. His name is Yashi. And when he was 10 years old, his father, his father's company in Tokyo went bankrupt. And his father with the family returned to their hometown in Okinawa. His father went ahead and by the time he arrived, by the time Yashi arrived after their father, his father had taken his own life. Now, for Yashi, that left him and his twin brother alone with their mother to care for them. And their mother worked day and night delivering newspapers in the morning and working in a bar at night. But she too died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage. And so Yashi didn't have anyone that he felt comfortable talking about this experience with. He felt different to other people until at high school age, he went to a summer camp organized by Ashinaga, where students were encouraged to talk about their past and talk about their histories. And for the first time, Yashi decided to share his story with the other people there. And I go to these summer camps regularly, and when you see these students like Yashi telling their story, it's incredible because together you can see them turning from often shy or sometimes introverted, becoming more and more open and friendly and sometimes confident. And so the students around Yashi hearing his story grew confident and grew more com confident. And because his story was so powerful, he was selected to be the head of the largest summer camp in all of Japan. And so a few years later, at 25 years old, at the base of Mount Fuji, he shouted his story into the night to a crowd of hundreds of university students who had suffered in the same way as he had. And into his story, he filled it with emotion and creativity. He was giving part of himself to the other people that were listening. And all of them, the whole crowd with tears in their eyes, they all grew closer together and they all drew strength. So if like Yashi, you want to motivate people then tell stories. Many people believe that to inspire, you have to be hugely successful. That's not so. In my experience, some of the most inspiring people have been modest or unassuming people. And if you told them that they'd actually inspired you, they're probably really embarrassed about it. But the fact is, is that we're all at different points on the journey of our lives. So wherever you are, whether you've accomplished a huge amount, whether you haven't accomplished a lot, give back to the people around you. Take a deep breath, inspire, think big, tell stories and challenge the status quo. Thank you.